it's Jeffrey with Real Nifty Vintage and I'm back with another video. This time around I have something a little bit different. Actually a subscriber sent me this humongous box and I'd love to say that it's a surprise but I actually already know what's in it and so it'll be a surprise for you. She sent me a message about a week ago asking if I wanted this and I'm just so excited. So she saw in a video where I was talking about what's in this box and you'll find out soon what's in here and I was just completely shocked that she wanted to send this to me. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and open it up here and we'll take a look at what's inside. There's t a ton of tape all over this, but my little blade here is getting through it. So that's great. Without cutting myself. All right. There was a ton of tape in this, on this box. So I'm ready to open it up and see inside. Wow, she did a great job at bubble wrapping. Either her, either she did or FedEx did, but lots of bubble wrap. Oh my gosh. All right. Jeez Louise. Wow, it even has a little carrying case. All right, so I'm gonna open this up and we'll take a look. My goodness. <laughs> so, what do you think it is? It's a bowl, right? Open it up. So cool. I had a recent video. It was a antique mall vlog style where I was walking around and I saw a whole set of these and she realized that she had some of these that she was actually just gonna go ahead and donate to her local local area. They were gonna donate them. And she thought I might as well enjoy them. And so that is so cool. It's not just one bowl, by the way. It's a whole set of them and they're buried in here. I'm gonna go ahead and try to work on getting the rest of these out of here. Wow. A lot of care went into this packaging. I'm very impressed. Every single bowl is wrapped in a whole bunch of bubble wrap and then in one of these protector bags and then inside the protector bag it's bubble wrapped with more pillows and then tape and bubble wrapped again. Goodness gracious. So this is the smaller of the bowls right here. That's the littlest one in the set. We have another one. I have to say, these are really cool, uh, like little padded holders for the bowls. I really like those. There we have the biggest of the mixing bowls. Okay. And that one. So that is all four mixing bowls, or are there five? Well, let me show you in just a minute. I think there's five. I've got a ton of bubble wrap now, so that'll come in handy quite a bit. Okay, let's see. These are actually in really good shape. She said that they had some wear to them, but you know, that is really good, the, the detailing on there. These are made by Hazel Atlas, and they are a mixing bowl set. Is there five? No, there's, yeah, there's five bowls. Wow, so cool. Complete shocker. I'm going to put these, are there six bowls? No, there's five. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my. Okay. There they are. Isn't that amazing? Wow. That is awesome. So these are going to be out on my countertop now. And as I, you might be able to see here, I have this ivy tablecloth. And then in keeping with the ivy theme, I have the Franciscan ivy uh, tea set here. So that's fun. And then I'll turn it around right here. We have the little Franciscan ivy salt and pepper shaker. So all of this ivy stuff is so amazing and it's 
awesome. So I have to, wow. So I have to give a big thanks to the subscriber that sent these to me. She did not have to do that, but they are amazing and I'm going to just love looking at them now because this is one of those things I probably wouldn't have ever bought for myself. I'm too cheap, but it's amazing that she was able to send these to me. So again, just amazing, really cool bowls, mixing bowls. Unfortunately, I don't really bake or cook or anything, but that's beside the point, right? So maybe I'll start doing that, start baking. I'm sure Aaron will like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have my check from the Tin Pin Antique Mall. I currently have two antique booths there. They are eight feet by eight feet. So they're squared, so I have two of those. And I have my check. Unfortunately, this is the lowest check I've ever received from there ever since I've had at least two booths. I know whenever I had the bookcase, and that's just a standard size bookcase, sort of similar to this one here. Whenever I had that size, it was I paid $20 a month in rent and I I think I made maybe $80 my first month, which is pretty good on a bookcase. But uh, yeah, as far as I can remember, having a booth or two, I've never made $130. Ugh, that's really terrible for one whole month, $130. Yeah, so sometimes it's just gonna be like that. Now this is January uh, or the, the sales for January. It's not February, but uh, I get my checks obviously the month after they're made um, so they can process them but so here's my check well not my check but here's the little paper that talks about it so it says that i made 145 dollars and 50 cents and then 14.55 of that was commission that's 10 percent of the total sales and then i got a check for 130 dollars so again not very good luckily i will say that my booth rent is not bad for the location that it's in. It could be a lot worse, but it is sort of out uh, kind of by itself. It's in a town, it's in, in, uh, it's in Carlisle, Illinois. So the town itself does get some traffic in the summer months more so because of the lake that's there. And people go jet skiing and they get on that, they get on the beach and all that. But uh, as far as the winter and everything goes, I would imagine that it's mostly up to the local people to keep it running and keep the stuff uh, selling in that mall. So let's just say I'm lucky to have any business at all whenever it's in the dead of winter like it is. But I did talk to the antique mall owner and it almost seems that the booths that the booths that do the best most of the time weren't doing the best this particular month and the booths that don't do very well got most of the business, which is completely fine. You can't always have amazing sales. So I did sell, like I said, about $130 worth. I'm gonna show you a little bit of what did sell. Uh, so a lot of little things, and then a couple larger things as far as dollar amounts. So a lot of things were like $2, $4, and those are the bread and butter. That's what keeps the bills paid. And then of course, some of these larger items sold, like a $20 item or, well, not much more. <laughs> about one $20 item and lots of little things. but. You know what, I'm, instead, of, instead of showing you this because it's gonna be really hard to see, I'm gonna read off what they are and then I'll show you an overview shot right here so you can see them up close. But I sold a green boot toothpick holder for $2.50, a Santa Claus salt and pepper for $4, an old wood rolling pin for $9, nut chopper, just, just picked another one of those up, $12, uh, vinegar, garlic, 101 Problem Solvers, that was a book, $5. Uh, strawberry Shortcake Carafe Pitcher, $5. Old Wood Spool, $12. If you remember that one, I just picked that one up recently. It was a wooden spool. There was a large one and a small one. I sold the large one, so that's awesome. Metal Cookie Cutters, $2. A Diet Pepsi Bottle, sold for $2. And then I did sell a good number of these old photographs. They're black and white photographs, and I picked them up in a large bundle at an auction or something like that. And I priced them for about $2 a piece. Now I will say, I have gone to antique malls and similar places where they'll mark them for a dollar a piece. And I think that sort of, I think that the antique mall owner, or the, uh, the booth owner is losing out a little bit there because I think that if you wanna buy something like that, someone's willing to pay a couple dollars at least for a nice photograph. So you could mark them all for a dollar, but by the time you, you know, you take into consideration this tag, 
the physical tag does cost money. Now it only may be three cents if you buy them in a huge quantity, or it could be upwards of five, five or 10 cents for one little tag. Then you're paying 10% commission, so that's another 10 cents out of your dollar. Uh, if you put them in any kind of a protective sleeve, whatever that sleeve costed you, even if you got the sleeve from practically nothing, there's time involved. So I'm just gonna throw it out there that I'm not gonna sell mostly anything in my booth for under $2. So I do sell these old photographs for $2 a piece and they sell pretty well, they come in waves. So I think one person probably bought all four of these in this case. I finally sold this little red frosted vase with scribbles. I put scribbles on here because I didn't know what else to call it. It was kind of like a spaghetti string decoration to it. And it wasn't the most exciting or lavish uh, vase, but it was pretty cool and retro looking. It sold for $2. I marked that down finally. And it was one of my older items, probably from the very beginning. I did sell some more glass ornaments as well, some Christmas ornaments after Christmas. Isn't that funny? And they sold for $3.50 a piece, which is a really good price for one single ornament and I'm just surprised about that. So I did sell four of those, probably again to the same customer, which I don't care, as long as they are selling, fantastic. And then I sold a weather station. I've had that weather station for a while. It's sort of an interesting thing. It's, I believe, made in Germany, and it kind of teeters in and out of this little house. So this, this uh, well, it's like a teeter-totter, but sideways, rather, and it kind of goes in and out depending on the weather conditions. I could never figure out how to work it. I don't even know if the one that I sold worked, but it's cool nonetheless. And then I also sold a Continental Trucking Anniversary gift thing. So that was basically a toy sized truck that was mounted on wood and it was given out to the Continental uh, Truck Company, probably as an anniversary gift if you worked there. I bought it for a dollar at an auction and I sold it for $12. So that is a prime example of buying things cheaply and selling them for a good amount. And those margins are spectacular, in my opinion, for a booth scenario. And then I also sold another rolling pin, I think. So I sold two rolling pins, again, probably to the same customer, and it sold for $7. And then a good flamingo covered casserole sold for $20. That was, I marked it for 20, so at some point I decided to mark it down because it wasn't selling for 24. Or honestly, what the mall owner recommends that we do sometimes is if you wanna go ahead and price it, let's say I wanted to put $30 on there, immediately, as I'm writing out the tag, cross that out with a red pin and rewrite a different price next to it, it makes the customer think that there was a markdown on it. It's sort of sneaky. I wouldn't have necessarily thought about it, but she, she said that it works, and I guess it does work. It's sort of a mental thing. It makes you think that you're getting a deal. Oh, Stella, you're coming into the picture, hi. Uh, so when I also sold two soaps, two handmade soaps for $9, that's what my little tags look like on those. So you can circle them at the register, whatever option you get, either one, two, or four. I prefer that you buy four at a time because I want to sell those in quantity because these soaps I do order, I don't make them. So I order these soaps off of national, no, naturalsoapwholesale.com and I'll put the link in the description. It's a pretty good company. They have good quality soap and they're, they're all natural if you choose to buy them that way, but they also have some that are nearly natural, which uses nearly all natural ingredients. But I'm on the whole pretty, pretty happy with them and their prices are reasonable. The only negative and downside to using them, and I think this is true with any big wholesale company, is they want you to order at least a certain quantity every time to qualify for free shipping. And so I have to order about $120 worth of soap each time to get that free shipping. So if you, if you haven't thought about that, but that's a lot of soap. And I don't want a whole bunch of just inventory sitting around. And frankly, I don't have the space in my booth to have a whole bunch of different skews of different smelling soaps. Plus, at the same time, I don't want to overly bombard the customer with too many options. So this, I'm sort of riding a fine line of having not enough and too much soap at the same time. And what inevitably happens is I'll sell out of one very popular soap that I should really be restocking often and I can't buy more of it. In this case, it's lavender. Lavender soap is very popular at my mall and it goes quickly. So I think the next time I can, I'm gonna buy double the quantity or triple the quantity of just the lavender alone because it's a very popular scent. Ironically, you know, you could go anywhere and buy some lavender soap. 
I try to buy the soaps on nat naturalwholesalesoaps.com that are more unique, ones that you can't find at the store. But you can go to Walmart and buy natural, you can buy lavender soap all day long, I think. But anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this video. I was able to get a good decent amount of sales and at least I'm not negatively in the hole for what I pay in rent. I'm almost there whenever you think of cost of goods sold, but all in all, you know, it's still working out. So hopefully February sales prove to be better and we just continue that trend upward throughout the month as the weather improves and people wanna get out and start shopping again. But I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up this video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Bye-bye.